All right, so welcome to today's um, activity sheet. I'm sorry, today's active teaching lab on discussions and forums for remote learning. So discussions and forums for remote learning is is our sort of our, it's our theme. And within that theme, I know that you all have some reason that you came here, and you can add that in the topics that you want us to address um, down below there. And once again, I think maybe for the last time for me, I will add that link to the activity sheet in the uh, discussion here on the right-hand side of your screen in Blackboard Collaborate. And I'll get going on and give you a little short lecture on our opening remarks or overview of what we what I think that we should talk about. And that is that discussions, online discussions are hard, right? We, the students don't behave the way that we think that they should um, in the way that they do in face-to-face -face discussions. There's a difference there, right? And we need to sort of tease out what are those differences and how do we um, do online discussions effectively? And I will tell you um, as a sort of early topic or, or hint idea that I've got on the activity sheet is start off with this. Reframe your thinking. Reframe your thinking because they're not online discussions. They're forums, right? And you might, especially asynchronous discussions, asynchronous discussions, people um, can come and go. They are not looking at your face as you're talking. They're not able to see your nonverbals. Um, you can't build off of their topics very, you know, in the moment, on the spur of the moment. So those, those are some negatives. On the other hand, they let you, online asynchronous discussions, let you, discussions, quote unquote, um, let you think before you submit something. They let you proofread what you're going to say. And in many ways, this is a great equalizer for people who are nervous about just speaking off the cuff, right? It gives them a chance to think about it. They can go do some online research on it and make sure that the, what they're going to say is what they want to say. You know, oftentimes, I, I'm one of those people who speaks and then figures out what I'm saying as I'm speaking. Um, so face-to-face -face discussions, I love them. I'm not good at them, but I love them. Um, because it lets me get into it. Online discussions let other people join in as well. So as you look through this activity sheet and as you look through some of these questions that um, or topics that you want us to address, think about your own discussions that you want to do online or the interactions that you want our students to engage with. Maybe interactions is a better one, right? Let's not call them discussions. Let's not call them um, uh, forums, we we'll say, what do you want to happen? What kinds of discussion or what kinds of engagements do you want the students to have with you, with each other, with the material, and start with that? And the answer, of course, to that is it should be along the lines and aligned with what your objectives are for the course and what the outcomes you have for that. So, excellent. Um, any quick questions so far before we um, start thinking about this and we're going to start working on um, some of, we're going to try to get out more of these ideas and experiences that you have had and that you are um, thinking about and uh, trying to get to the bottom of or get good answers for, okay? Any questions? Raise your hand. All right. So yeah, we have 57 attendees. All right, that's fantastic. And we have six moderators. Hey, moderator, who's going to help me with the groups today? Can you break us up into five groups? And now break us up into six groups, but put me in number one, if, if possible. Or whoever's in number one, keep an eye on that main room, and let's pull them into new groups as well, um, if we can. And in your session, I want you to think about, in your small group breakout group, I want you to think about what you want to get out of today's session. Think about those experiences that you've had that you would like to find better ways of doing this. And if you have had a really good experience in an online discussion, 
share with the group what what it did, what you did to make that happen, uh, whether it was on purpose or a happy accident. Okay. All right, and what we'll do is we'll give people just, well, let's give them 15 minutes for that, um, for that quick discussion. And turn on your microphones, introduce yourselves, and play along with that. And it's going to be a little bit weird, right? So, but think about this as you're experiencing this as a student. So play along and see what you can do, okay? Thank you very much, and let's go into the groups. All right, and I am in the main room. Very good. So I'm not able to drag myself into a group. So can someone assign me to wherever I can go? Sure. Let's see what group you want to be in. Karen's got group one. Group two. How about group two? I'm going to move you into group two. Sounds great. All right, he should be in group two. And Karen Spader, mm -hmm. can you take a group? Group two. I'll move myself into group three. It looks like they don't have a moderator. Hello, group three. Are you? Am I in here with you yet?
Mire.
the main Question. room. Five. Oh. It always goes so fast. <laughs> it really does. Dan Pell? All right, I see some. And Lisa, Lisa, how about you? Your hand is raised. Uh, All right, we're, I see that your hand is raised. And I was wondering if you had a, a question for us or thoughts. I just had a thought to share. I recently, um, I'll drop it in the chat or in the activity sheet. Um, I recently learned uh, about a model of online discussion, which depends on a small, it's intended to be a full class discussion, but mm -hmm. it's intended on um, setting up a small group of students to seed the discussion. So not everyone is making an original post uh, right off the bat, um, but instead that that is assigned to a small group of students and that group can rotate um, throughout the course. All right. So in many ways, you're empowering the students to be in charge of those discussions or forums themselves and that they run it. Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, I could imagine it working lots of different ways. Um, yeah. The link I'll share has an example about like, you know, um, you know, identifying uh, four proposals for doing a thing, um, but one could also imagine this centered on particular texts, maybe having students sign up to be the kind of the the seeding group for different texts throughout the semester. Um, so I could see lots of different ways to organize that. And and that that is the other part because you're getting the students to think about how would I teach this? And so they have to do some of that higher level Bloom's thinking in order to say, what are the important things? What do I need to have the students uh, synthesize? Do I just need them to understand it or remember it? Um, but yeah, that's, that's awesome. Very good. Um, I'd like to introduce Lynn, um, Lynn Luke from the discussion project. And one of the reasons that I wanted, I wanted to make sure that she was involved today because they've done lots of great research. And I don't know how many of you in the, um, of our participants have taken the discussion project um, class, is it a class uh, experience? But it's, um, it's a great way um, you learn about how to discuss, how to frame and um, structure there's a lot of structure in a good face-to-face -face discussion. So I thought that getting uh, Lynn's voice in here um, to help us tease apart what's usable and what's not usable and how can, how might we do some other, um, some of the, how might we achieve some of the goals that we want to achieve in these discussions in an online space? Um, she can help us tease that out. So, Lynn, anytime that you want to jump in and add your thoughts to that, go ahead and unmute yourself and jump in, okay? All right. Very good. Thank you. So, let me see a, a show of hands if you talked in your small groups about building trust or building community. Click on that. Raise your hand. All right. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Does anyone have any thoughts on any topic that is bigger than building trust um, to achieve the goals that we want to have in the uh, in discussions? Well, I'll just add in that on this topic, the discussion project, we collected a lot of data this spring on the shift to remote learning. And we interviewed 92 students and 26 instructors and a few themes came out, and one of them was the, the importance of building community, just like in a face-to-face -face discussion um, in a class. Uh, students really need a level of comfort, um, sort of emotional safety, in order to feel like they can um, take part. So that, that came to the top. 
Another was the presence of the instructor in a, in a variety of ways, the clarity of the instructions, and also a real valuing of synchronous video conference discussion as much as you're able to in your format to, to integrate that. Um, I'll pause there. Yeah, all right. So did any of you in your discussions think, share any um, strategies for building trust? Things that you've seen worked, uh, that, that have worked, or things that you've seen or done that did not work at all and you would not recommend? Because I think it's important that we know about those too. Go ahead and put it in chat or raise your raise your hand. Guideline Sandrine says, yeah, it's Rit, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, it makes you feel so philosophical when you have a, a big change like this from one format to another because it, it makes one, you know, wonder how how uh, how I feel about things like trust or how I feel about things like the role of the teacher or how I feel about knowledge, how I feel knowledge may be acquired. Like, I, I don't know, maybe my, my proclivity, but I find myself probably overthinking a lot of that kind of stuff. But, you know, when I taught, when um, um, we heard a few minutes ago about, about trust and um, comfort, th those things are all pretty different to me. Like, for example, I'm ambivalent about comfort. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, very on inclusion, um, but holding the bar up, not in a kind of Sergeant Carter wave. And I mean, um, a little bit like the joking our culture is doing now about, you know, showing up to a Zoom meeting with just your shirt on and, you know, not having any pants, you know, like the sort of comic page level joking about what it means to be professional. I expect my students are at work when they come to my class, like you have come to work now. And so I'm trying to find a way without being some sort of a hard ass about it to, to show my students that I need you to be physically visible to me and to each other. And I need you to be, be like in bold letters in class um, without, you know, cracking the whip or, I mean, I don't mind cracking the whip a little bit, but I, you know, that the message is not about like, I'm trying to teach you discipline. The message is we have serious work to do here together and I need you uh, all to be together and to do this. And it's, a, you know, I guess that sounds kind of coachy, but I mean, that's kind of how I, I, I see it working. Otherwise, um, if the message is, um, you know, we can we can lighten up on you now. You know, I have a, a system that allows for two um, absences that require no explanation. And then everyone beyond that, there's a there's a loss to your final grade. So mm -hmm. students can spend them like coins in their pocket. And we talk about that at the beginning and so on. So it gives them some freedom, but at the same time requires some responsibility from them. So I, you know, I, I angle with that myself and it is kind of a, um, a kind of a personal philosophy conversation that helps to have with other colleagues, uh, at least helps for, helps for me to hear how people understand what it is you're doing when you're um, inviting students in and requiring them to do things or ex expecting things from them. So let me let me um, let me ask folks about uh, two things. Well, first of all, Lynn, yes, you've got a you've got an immediate reaction. I, I think this is a, a point very well taken in that we want students to really engage in these sessions. Um, and another thing we found in our data is that students said over and over again. It's so difficult when I'm on a, a video conference call and the norm has become that most people don't have their cameras on. They really prefer to be able to see somebody's face. Now, of course, we have to recognize that there are reasons, as is put in the chat here, why some students, probably the exception rather than the norm, will not be able to um, use the, the camera function. But establishing that from the beginning and um, communicating with the students about uh, that that cannot um, display their video um, is is really important for um, that focus. And I think it really reduces the distractions for students. That's what they said. It I get more distracted if the norm is that I just turn off my camera. And I'm more engaged if most people have their cameras on. And we've heard this from um, a huge student survey um, that the digital accessibility group did um, on campus with students uh, about that. They love it when they can do it, but there's an issue of equity in this. And we can see that happening in the chat with Jordan. Um, and Jordan, I don't know if you want to jump in and, and talk about that at all. But I think that it's it's a very good point 
some students are, are taking care of their kids while they're working. So um, in a regular class situation where they had child care that was taken care of, that was uh, fairly easy for them to work around, right? Because they had, their kids were in school. The situation has changed now. So can we expect them to participate synchronously the same way that we could have in a face-to-face -face semester? And I think that there's, there's something about that. Um, bandwidth. We all expect 100% bandwidth when they come into the classroom that we have a controlled environment, right? They sit in the seat, they all have access to watch us. But in a uh, online or remote teaching environment, some of them might have low bandwidth. Some of them might be in the parking lot of the local library in the car with their kids in the back seat, babysitting them while they're trying to get online and they don't, they can't show their faces. Um, in an ideal world, we would all have great bandwidth and tools, but that's not not the case. So, yep. Um, on expectations, who has who has tried having their students involved in those expectations, in coming up with those expectations? So it's not something that we put on our students, but it's something that the students put on themselves or come up with each other about. Go ahead, Ramel. Uh, yeah, so I teach in the business school, and on day one, um, we hand out little index cards to every student, and we ask them to write down what expectations do they have of themselves as a student, of each other as classmates, and then what expectations do they have of us? And we actually refer to them as community standards. And so when we get the more hot button topics, like the week that we're talking about identity and inclusive leadership, we bring back that slide and then again ask, is there anything that anyone would like to add to this? Um, so I think that's kind of important because then they do feel that they have their own selves to be accountable to as well. I love this for two reasons. One, you're empowering them from the very beginning to take charge and to be, um, have some say in in what's important. But the second thing is you revisit it because things can change. And my best plans of like, I think that this should be the expectation hits reality. And we realize that, huh, this might not be a reasonable expectation. So let's revisit that. Or maybe we totally missed this other thing. So that idea of let, let's iterate, let's build on this. I think that's that's awesome. Thank you. Any other thoughts or th ideas on that? I, in my yeah. um, course that I taught in the past, I did a, a slight variation on that one, is that it wasn't so much just course expectations, but it was uh, for the students for themselves, but I handed out that same three by five index card and had them think about what goals they had for themselves. What are the goals that you have for this course? How are you gonna make this course relevant to yourself? Um, because again, I was seeing that they weren't expecting to get anything out of this course. It was a general ed requirement that a business major and an art major all had to take no matter what. They didn't necessarily want to take it, but they had to take it. Uh, so helping them to identify how they were gonna be able to use these things in their own jobs or their career or their own larger education really help them set expectations for themselves of like, oh, I can make this relevant to me. I can make this relevant to what I'm trying to do. I can dig into the components of this course that I can find most um, connection to uh, in my own um, personal goals. So that was useful, I found. And let me build on that as well by saying, in doing that, one, you're showing the students that you care enough to ask them. Um, and if you can share back in some anonymized way, some of the things that the students have said and show that you are addressing those, two things happen. One, they see evidence that you are caring for them and listening to them. And two, they're seeing that their own ideas that they might have thought earlier, oh, I'm the only one who thinks this way, or I'm the only one who's interested in that. No, there are other students in that same situation looking for the same things. And they might be like, oh, I'm only interested in it for this way, or I'm not interested in it. And then they see somebody else's input, and now they can say, huh, I never thought of it that way. Now I'm interested. So as an instructor, we have a very 
specific and oftentimes biased view on our content, right? We love it. We just dedicated, you know, half of our life to get to the point that we're at where we can talk about it. Not all of our students are like that, right? And we often make assumptions that, well, they should be because I am. But if we can harness the students to talk to each other about it and share out how they are connecting with the content, how they are personalizing it, they can learn from each other and be inspired from each other. I Very really good. Like the, I really like the idea of a, um, anonymous, you know, sharing back what other people were thinking because, again, they might not have wrote it down, but they're kind of they're just interested enough not to put it in, but they're interested. Help them to see that other people are. Excellent. Uh oh. I reserved in my course for the things that they were talking about the most. So that, anyways, I'll must not be hearing me. Um, you just skipped out there for a minute for me. I don't know if that was the case for other people as well. Um, Karen Spader, I see you in chat with a really good point. Can you um, talk about that? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I guess I was just saying that we were talking about trust a few minutes ago uh, and that this for me really brought to light my my perspective on learning not just being about the content that we we are we have a context around us we can't deny that and that context that we come from that we live in that we face every day shapes our learning experiences and so i think in order to build trust we have to recognize that we have to have to have to value our students, not just as consumers of knowledge, but as individual people who live lives and the content that we're delivering to them um, can only be interpreted and learned if we if if they're able to place it into their own context. So I guess yeah. that's kind of what I was getting at. Um, yeah. All right. Excellent. And we've got another hand raised. Go ahead, Sandrine. Yes, good. I was about to ask you. <laughs> um, yes. Um, so um, Karen just spoke. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, one way, and, and also based on what you you uh, said, John, um, how to really um, um, represent their their concerns and their ideas. One thing that I did this semester was a, an exit ticket. Um, where students talked about their main takeaway for the lesson, but also the Madias point on light bulb moments. But I also got feedback on the format, what worked for them or didn't. And then I would Great. start my lesson. If oh, their feedback were anonymous, but were incorporated in my lesson, that it was the at the beginning of them my lesson. I copied and pasted some of their feedback, and I felt that was one way of really ensuring that yeah, I, I did listen to. Uh, the way they felt about the course. It wasn't uh, all about the content, it was how it was delivered and how, and I found that worked very well. Yeah, Great. because I think it's important too to say it doesn't have to, we don't have to have these big elaborate plans, just accepting feedback and and, and valuing it enough to, to say, I hear you, I recognize it, yeah. that, that goes a long way. Yeah. Great. Um, Rit, and then I want to hear from Shira if, if she's willing um, as well. And then Thanks, I want to Connor. get to the activity sheet. I, have, I haven't met Chiara, but I was just looking at your, your comment, Chiara, following up on what Sandrine said and what Karen said. And I'm still thinking about trust and I'm thinking about um, the, the problem is um, in acknowledging context and being open to different types of life's, you know, things that are unfolding in real time out there in the parking lot yeah. by the way. On the other side of the camera all that stuff is really important but it doesn't preclude the goal of focus on what we're doing here now together so i would say um absolutely invite the kids to be there you know all that stuff is really important you know my kids have grown now but i understand the dilemma um nonetheless the problem is is multitasking like right now kiara was just making this point I, i'm not really listening to you when i'm engaging in the chat i'm in another place i'm on another class i'm in another conversation it's really different breakout groups when everyone goes and at one time we're all working on one task so i'm really concerned about um creating expectations that say like everything's cool you know you can be juggling lots of stuff while this is happening and doing whatever you want with your camera on or i mean we understand that some people can't have the camera on some people have to have children or an elderly family member next to them or whatever it is but like how can we use these tools to keep people focused on the work 100 percent that they're doing while they're 
the classroom? That's the that's the question I have. That's a great question. And Kira, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, oops. Sorry, I think my video will work. Um, yeah, so I think I, I my question just stems from what's been going on right now uh, for the past five minutes. Uh, is there was a really interesting discussion going on in the live video, and then people started making really interesting contributions in the chat. And so I was trying to I find myself you know trying to follow the the chat and then realizing I'm totally missing things going on in the video. And, and so I, so that it's interesting, it makes me wonder, well, what, what is the best use of the chat? Um, and I think that's a great feature because there are some people maybe who um, feel shy at first or want to make a contribution that way. But yeah, it's now I'm starting to think, well, what, how should the chat be used as a way in a way that's not distracting from the main discussion going on in the live video. So. Yep, and it's a it's a thing that that it's a yes. In some ways, it's a yes and. If you do not structure the chat, you know that the students will structure their own chat in the background because back channel is a thing, whether it's um, formalized or informal. So that's a, it's a thing that you know maybe maybe there are ways to do them both. Excellent. Um, Karen, go ahead. Yes, I had this problem, uh, which is rare because I always teach faculty, but I had this happen in the summer where they were having a side discussion in the chat about soccer. <laughs> and that can be distracting, you know, having their kids in the same soccer program and all of that. So I think it's really important, just like you set an etiquette in an online course, to have some etiquette for your synchronous discussions that you let it be clear what the chat is used for and what it should not be used for so you don't have those personal discussions. Instead, have a place in your course where they could, if they wanted to have personal discussions, they could have that. I call it the internet cafe or someplace like that. But make sure that they know that what they're doing here is either you know, summarize some main points, ask your questions so we can address them, be very clear on what they should do in the chat because they are used to chatting. And uh, you might be surprised at the type of things they put in there. And we do want to get to know each other, but it is distracting if it isn't related to the topic. So I think if you just have some some, uh, some etiquette and guidelines on what the chat should be used for, I think it's very helpful. Like we can see here, people sharing ideas and resources and commenting on the uh, what we're talking about. That's all appropriate. So that's just my two cents. All right. And I've gone ahead and I've shared uh, the activity sheet. And I'm going to put that into the chat one more time so that you can access it as well. Um, and we have some really good examples already here. We only have 12 minutes left. And I will tell you, I absolutely agree that there are things happening in the chat. And you know, if you haven't noticed, we've got three things going on here, right? We've got the chat. We've got face-to-face -face or synchronous live um, video discussions, and I've added in this activity sheet, right? It's kind of crazy how much I'm asking you to juggle between different things. Is this the best practice that we have to offer? I would say probably not. Um, one of the things and one of the reasons that I do this is because they all have different uses. If I could turn off the Blackboard Collaborate chat, um, completely and say, we're only going to use the chat that's in Google Docs, I would do that because the Google Doc chat is persistent. So people can go back and revisit that after after we have our synchronous session. Everything that we put into the, the chat on the side here, I think that that's going to go away. Um, and, and yes, the activity sheet is overwhelming, but it's not meant for the here and now. It's meant as sort of a documentation um, of things. So you can go back and take your time with it. You don't have to um, address everything on it right now. In fact, if you do, it would be um, insanity building in, in some ways. Um, so yes. That said, um, are there any, let's see, we had a question about Teams that was maybe a, a technical question in my breakout group. Um, 
And there it is, JT has already jumped into it, and I'll highlight it. So Microsoft Teams, I don't know how many of you have used it. Um, it works well with Outlook, and it's not, it's a Microsoft thing, so there is some connection. It's a campus-supported tool now, and people are more and more using it in um, their teaching and learning as well, um, although that's still kind of exploratory at this point, I understand. Um, but yeah, people are asking, you know, that that the chat in that is great, and file sharing in that is good, much better than Blackboard Collaborate, but it doesn't have breakout groups. So what are the pros and cons there? Karen has added a, a link to a good comparison there, and we're going to add that um, into the activity sheet as well. I'm just going to take a copy and paste that in. Um, so yeah, there's 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 that option. Um, Does somebody want to highlight one that they really want to talk more about? Lisa, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to highlight a question that was asked in the um, activity yeah. sheet. Uh, yes. about uh, dealing with sensitive subjects such as race and race um, oh, and yes. configuring groups. Yeah, so. Um, um, and that that's a big, big one. And it's also part of the trust building, right? Um, because if you cold turkey, uh, not cold turkey, just right off uh, the bat or um, without introduction, and without having that level of trust built already, you have a sensitive topic in discussions or in an online forum, there's all kinds of terrible things that can happen, right? You need to have um, that slow, painful process, um, or, or slow process at least, maybe it's not painful, but that slow process of building that trust before you can have really substantive, um, controversial discussions, right? Lynn, go ahead. Yeah, that's much of what I was going to say as well, is um, really thinking about the the scope of your syllabus, or not the scope, really the, tra the trajectory of it, and um, pushing those discussions that are going to be more difficult um, and, and more charged and just, you know, raise emotions, um, and for which you need to have already established norms and expectations and Kind of revise them together, pushing those activities towards later in the semester when you have a better feel. Um, so that's one thing. Another is, and related to this, is um, as you can imagine, students report that because of the, you know, a little bit of the alienation of being online. Although there are some great things about being online, um, the the um, community building activities, which I know it can sound kind of cheesy in a way, but they're even more important for students to develop a level of, um, you know, of, of comfort. It's and I know that also can sound to people a little bit squishy, but it, I I promise you that it comes up over and over again in the data about face-to-face -face discussion and online discussion that that students simply will will not speak, what will not participate as much unless they feel not like, oh, I'm very, very comfortable that nobody's going to disagree with me, not in that way, but that that things will be managed um, managed appropriately and, and students have the tools and the instructor has the tools when there are moments um, that create a rift in the community and there needs to be um, some repair. Absolutely, and that's like when that happens, it's it's shocking for everybody, right? Everybody seems to have um, trouble navigating those spaces, and it takes some time to be able to do that. Christy, please um, go ahead. So this is what terrifies me about teaching what I teach online. I don't have the luxury of pushing sensitive topics to later on. I start with the slave trade. That's just the reality. I'm also a black instructor at a predominantly white institution. So I, I don't have the luxury of trying to push a sensitive topic. 
everything right. I teach is sensitive, every class period, every lecture, um, because I teach race in America and the African American experience. And so I don't, and that is, you know, one of the reasons why I'm trying to do these kind of things of thinking through this is I don't have, you know, a couple of difficult days. They're all yep. difficult. So one of the ways that might work for that is, is uh, what I've got highlighted here is to really constrain what what is an, an acceptable response or discussion. Um, so not necessarily the reaction, but like things like assigning actions or saying, you know, you've got to add three compliments and a comment or, or, or three compliments, a, a compliment, comment and question, a connection, and then a question. Are, are there other ways that we can have um, some constraints on on what they should do so that they don't jump into uh, too far too fast. And Hazel, I know you've got some great ideas on this as well. Go ahead. Well, I don't know that they're great, but what I would say is even if the content that one is teaching does not is not like Christy has acknowledged, when we're doing our educating in a larger context like the one we're in and being silent because we want to uh, pass it on, uh, not pass it on, but build an infrastructure of trust, quote unquote, before we, we broach it, that in some sense you will wind up betraying trust if one is silent, completely silent on it. Uh, at time that it's living large. So there needs to be some acknowledgement and attention to it. And also acknowledge that one doesn't have the tools right now to fully deal with it, but you don't want to act like through silence that it can be ignored because there's no neutral place to stand or sit in the face of the kind of turbulence that many of your students, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them, and so you might be holding trust for one segment of the student population, but seriously betraying trust for others. So I just want us to be mindful of that. It's not just about the content that we're teaching. It's also about the context within which the teaching is going on. A absolutely. And man, wow, Jen, I, I love what you had in the, the space there on the, on the chat. Um, can we do this every day? And, and right now, to, you know, today's um, shutdown STEM um, day, how do we address issues uh, that are happening in cities across the world right now um, in discussions? Um, it's a, to Hazel's point, I don't have the tools right now to do this, but and I, I'm glad that we've got other people here that we can call on um, or, or, or who can jump into this stuff. Um, and Lynn, you had something probably not about that. I didn't mean to um, add that. Peggy, can you talk more about the, the guidelines for respect and, and how do you deal that or how would you, how can you imagine doing that? Um, well, I share the concern for the ethnic studies perspectives. I teach in ethnic studies as well, but I think um, right, right from the first day, we need to set up guidelines for respectful engagement and also perhaps have some um, uh, follow up on what could happen if behavior is inappropriate. So I, I think the guidelines should be firm and, um, you know, for what purpose of inclusiveness and respect. I think that should be made very clear from the get-go. Peggy, is this something that um, you lead as the instructor or do you involve, and, and how do you involve maybe, um, the students in that conversation and, and, and in setting those expectations. And it is two o'clock, yeah, no, so if you yeah, all I'm, need to go, go ahead. I'm going to stay on here for a, a while longer as because there's a lot of great stuff that we need to continue to talk uh, about. Yeah, I, I'm 
thinking this all through as I speak, but I think that Great. Um, everything needs to be geared from the start to um, from the purpose of the class, which is inclusiveness, diversity, uh, respect for race, eth ethnic uh, difference, and um, other things. So I think that right from the start, the values need to be um, put up to the class, and they should be involved in the discussion, but perhaps maybe a questionnaire, you know, because some of these students may come from families or backgrounds where they have not considered racism as being an, a, an important issue. So I think that, yes, I think that interchange um, conversations need to happen, but it needs to be, uh, you need to set up first the, the rules for engagement. Good. Lynn, go ahead. Hi, sorry, I made a mistake with my mic before. Um, yes, I absolutely agree that, that day one is about community building and it's about the students, you know, all of our environments. Um, and the, the community building, the low stakes questions, but also those questions that are getting at, the, you know, the context that we're living in. Um, even if that's not a, a core part of your curriculum, and for many of you it is right out, out of the gates, as you're saying, that's, it is through those actual day-to-day um, -to -day topics and what the range of experience that you're building, you're building that trust. And so perhaps I, you know, I didn't articulate this well before, um, it, it really depends on your curriculum, but if, if you are, um, if you are digging into a, a particular kind of like deep assignment, that might be something that you wanted to wait for to build community before um, engaging in. Um, but right, uh, it, it's it's a project that is is right at the opening, getting students talking and um, learning about each other. That will allow for them to have the discussions and be prepared for at any point um, how to engage in conversations and projects that are going to um, to challenge them and be really meaningful for their lives. Good. Peggy? Uh, yeah. I think that really um, I agree with Christy. You can't wait to present the key issues of your class. Um, and. Um, I think that, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm flaking out on what I was going to say, so continue. I'll try to come back if I remember. Hazel, go ahead. Oh, unmute, unmute yourself, Hazel. I, I would say as an educator, it's very important to not just be concerned about the curricular content, but and we need to be concerned about the pedagogical strategies and the nature of the learning environment we're doing both of those things in and so a constant point of inquiry i would say is given how i'm proceeding with both my content and my pedagogy what's the messaging for my students on who matters and who belongs that should start at the beginning and it's part of you know the codes of engagement that we set up who matters who belongs what matters, what belongs. And that's separate from the curricular content and the instructional pedagogy strategies used, but they're, they're intertwined. And I think too often the environment itself, the crucible is left to chance and the leaving to chance is what results in blow ups down the road. So we need to be much more intentional, especially in the turbulent environment we're in right now in terms of the larger macro context. Um, awesome, go ahead, Peggy. Could I, yeah, I do remember yeah. what I wanted to say. Um, I agree with this idea of pedagogy and content going, are intertwined. Um, I think that I've been thinking this through and I believe history speaks for itself. Um, and I think that if you're presenting your curriculum you may not have to add too much comment. I mean, you know, of course you're going to guide them, but I think that the history itself also has a powerful way of, um, you know, getting certain points across that we need to teach the students. And we want to prepare them, right? 
like that's that's the the big goal is how do we prepare them to have these conversations um, effectively? Karen, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to do a shout out to uh, Kim Plummer at Veterinary Medicine. So we teach uh, veterinary anatomy and that's uh, three to four students working for nine hours a week uh, doing dissection. And so you can imagine that can have some intensity. So one of the very first exercises on the very first day that we do is we have them write out a contract where they talk about how they will show respect for each other, how they'll be prepared, how they'll be kind to each other. And one of the things that she always talks to them about is uh, that they have an elastic spirit. So it will be challenging to be in lab for 15 weeks, nine hours a day with the same three to four people. Um, and then what was interesting is that's the very first day of vet school, basically. And then we were telling them for the COVID students, those second and third year students, we were reminding them of their elastic spirit. So when things were getting tough and Blackboard was uh, kicking them out and making it, we uh, were constantly saying, don't forget elastic spirit and to kind of touch back to that very first day of vet school. So uh, a little shout out on our kind of elastic spirit we have to try to keep up with that school. Yeah, elastic spirit is great. I love that. Dan, go ahead. Dan Pell, are you unmuted? Thanks. Um, I really appreciate all the perspectives that I'm hearing. I missed half this conversation, so I hope it's sorry, raining here. Um, I had to run outside. I hope it's recorded. Um, but part of my question um, I had posted something about this in the discuss in the activity sheet is about um, you know how to how to sensitively group people around topics related you know sensitive topics like race um, sounds like that is what you're talking about um, do how, throwing this out to the group is this new medium that we are finding ourselves in making that harder to be sensitive to is the is this online experience where you don't actually even know or recognize you know you see a list of names you make groups you don't know any you're not able to even visually verify the background or or you know potentially um the experiences uh, of the students that you're grouping together is this is that making it harder to be sensitive and what can we do um, through this medium to be to make sure that we don't um, lose um, perspective and and kind of um, end up making it worse through our, our practices? Thanks. Yeah, that's a very good point. Go ahead, Lynn. Well, this is where I think Hazel's point is is so important is in in planning your. You don't just plan your curriculum, you're planning your instruction and, and that um, that student experience from the beginning. And uh, it, does re it does require more in an online environment to um, get feedback from students about how it's going, getting to know each other, what, what would help, what are ways of interacting where they feel like they can become more comfortable. Again, small groups. Um, are important, but not, you know, they have to be um, structured in such a way after developing norms and expectations together and kind of making sure that you're reinforcing them um, in those small groups. That's where students get to know each other by name, which is another thing that um, is, is so, so important for building community and, and understanding each other. So I think, um, Yes, it's it's more challenging. It's not insurmountable, but it certainly requires that you have the the lens of, as Hazel put it, that intertwining of curriculum, um, instruction, and social emotional learning in in this platform. Great, good, Lisa. Um, oops. Yeah, I would also add, um, Devin makes a point in the activity sheet that, you know, where when we configure groups in a face to face setting and, you know, certainly I when I was teaching, I would certainly try to cluster, be intentional about um, clustering people safe who kind of visually coded as racial minorities, et cetera. Um, 
but even in that setting, we are making guesses about how people might racially identify. Um, and I think here's a place where I'm not sure if this come up, came up earlier, but the beginning of term student survey, asking people, certainly not surveying them about their racial or ethnic identities, asking them to provide some texture about, you know, going into this class, what do you feel are your immediate connections to the um, subject matter and the types of discussions, you know, you can see from the syllabus that, you know, I'm going to be setting up for us as the instructor. Um, and that that can be a way into configuring groups. And I also, um, and again, this is a question of translation to the online format, but I certainly like to have, um, you know, sequences of groups. So people cycle through maybe a couple different groups um, through discussion um, so that maybe they start off um, clustered with, uh, you know, having a more kind of affinity group style conversation and then disperse to another group um, and being really intentional about building in moments for reflection. What was That's I, really you know, what was really, what did I hear from this first group? Um, what did I hear from the second group? Um, and providing a mix of like, anonymous and non-anonymous forums for sharing those reflections. Groups are really interesting. And, and the, the, the question of do I stay with a, a small group for an extended period of time or, or how long before I switch over to another group, like that's an interesting balance because if I'm the first time in, I'm in a small group, it is hard for me to trust them to, um, to be able to speak my mind, right? Because I, I don't know them yet. So after the second or third experience, I'm starting to open up to them a little bit more. So there's there's benefit in having that same group over and over. But to your point, Lisa, it's really valuable to have the input from different groups. So figuring out how to have both, you know, how can we have both? How can we learn from other groups but and other voices um, while still being able to build the, the trust that we need to fully participate in the groups that we're in. Hazel, please. You can have two strands of groupings. One is to build the muscle for being able to operate in groups where there's regular changes, maybe not every time. So if it's meeting three times a week, maybe weekly or bi-weekly, but cycling through and the, the matchup is random and then having some measure of choice for the students to decide what affinity groups they want to be in and to then have, so they're going parallel. This is something that National Training Labs did. There were the human, I've forgotten what they call, but like one is a home-based kind of group, which would be more of that. their choice. And the other is really to build their muscle in hearing a multiplicity of perspectives, ways of being, doing and engaging. And so the trust is built over time, not necessarily with that group of people, but with the process of being, you know, immersed in, in different, different groups of folk. And please, I want to just re, I was saying curricular content, pedagogy, and the learning environment. It's the learning environment that we typically don't pay enough attention to and how that's sending the message of mattering and belonging. So, you know, and it's not, it's not just the content, it's not just the pedagogy, it's the combination in addition to other stuff where history comes in and all that other. So just mindfully bearing in mind those three forces are activated in the learning. I love that two strands, the home base strand to build trust and go deep and the second group to build the muscle and the experience and hearing from different voices. I'm totally gonna steal that. Thank you, Hazel. Please go ahead, honey. Very good. Are there any last things before we call it a, a, a session? Hazel. Oh, your, I'm sorry, your hand was raised again. Oh, and you're muted. I never took it off, so I guess. Oh, OK. <laughs> Very good. And. Maria, do you want to share the, the bell hooks quote um, in closing? 
Well, I think the amazing bell hooks speaks for herself. Um, so I will leave it there. But for me, my my own personal takeaway from this um, this idea is that uh, anti-racist teaching requires um, letting go and a deep interrogation of who we are as teachers and what the power dynamics that are at play in our classroom um, have been and how we can start to deconstruct that through discussion and um, prioritizing student voice. Awesome. Thank you all for joining and staying as the conversation continued and really grew at the end there. Um, I really appreciate it. Rhonda, go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you so much. I've got this great page of notes. I've got the document there. This totally spoke to all of my concerns. Thanks to everyone who contributed. Wonderful. I would, I would just like to say one more thing on the elastic spirit, which I love the phrase. I do too. Just know that some people's elastic has been stretched so much that it almost has little. So we need to be mindful that that those efforts to help folk stretch, that it lands on different students differently, depending on that messaging about who matters, who belong, given the default construction of content and pedagogy. So just, it's an awesome concept, but it, it lands differently on different students. That's a very good point. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon and This is the week. wonderful, thank you. Thank you for your participation, Hazel. Yeah. And Dominique and Peter and Sandrine and Dan and Maria and everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>